You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. Good evening and welcome to the final night of the 2016 Music IC Festival. My name is John Kenyon and I'm the Executive Director of the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature Organization. I would like to thank you for joining us for tonight's performance. I would like to begin tonight by thanking our sponsors, without whom this would not be possible. The University of Iowa, Dunn Investments, West Music, Toyota of Iowa City, Knutson Construction, the Iowa Summer Writing Festival, Iowa Public Radio and Edgington Alignment. Yes, thank you. Now, this year's festival theme is inspiration and homage. Each program has included work that has been inspired by other works of art or created as an homage to an artist. We had a modern composition inspired by a key change in a Haydn quartet, Mozart quartets written in homage to Haydn, and a Beethoven quartet inspired by Romeo and Juliet. You can read more about all of those connections in the print program that you have tonight. Now tonight, that inspiration has led to the creation of new work. We asked four writers associated with the Iowa Summer Writing Festival to listen to tonight's piece, the string quartet in A minor, Opus 13 by Felix Mendelssohn, and then to write something inspired by that work. The idea for this program was that of artistic director Tricia Park, who has programmed the festival for the past six years. This new aspect of the festival is an exciting one for the City of Literature. When we agreed to take over the festival this year, it was with projects like this in mind, and the work created by these four writers is a tremendous realization of the potential of such an endeavor. Tonight's program, Mendelssohn as Muse, will be performed by the Solera Quartet, with additional performance by singer Megan Bruce and pianist Minji Kwan. Our writers will read in this order, Sabrina Ora-Mark, Robin Hemley, Amy Margolis, and Daniel Kalachi. There will be no intermission. At the conclusion of tonight's program, I would encourage you to join us for a reception in the Englert's gallery space upstairs. And on Saturday, keep in mind, we bring the festival to a close with what Dvorak did on his summer vacation, a family concert at 1030 at the Iowa City Public Library. And now, please help me to welcome to the stage Festival Artistic Director, Tricia Park. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and thank you to John for that wonderful introduction. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about the project tonight as well. Um, this is such an exciting uh, sort of coming together of an idea I had when I started this festival, which was um, the mission of in, uh, exploring where the intersection of music and literature lives and where creati creativity comes from, and in a larger sense, um, the idea of storytelling in its many guises. Um, so we're really thrilled to be presenting these four brand new works by these incredible four writers that you'll be hearing from today, and that's part of our um, long-standing relationship with Amy Margolis and the Summer Writing Festival, which we are also so excited about and very excited that she's um, one of our writers and performers this evening. All four pieces are extremely uh, personal, very diverse, and so moving. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting these to you and um, welcoming you here for this very unique and original concert-going experience. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome all the performers onto stage and begin the concert.
there's a hole in the bucket. I look at the bucket. There is unquestionably a hole. An entire family could live in this hole. I see the hole, I yell, call Mendelssohn. My husband, dear Henry, calls Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn comes right over. We look at the bucket. There is a hole. Mendelssohn studies it. He takes some notes. The southernmost edge of the hole is silent, possibly frozen. The northernmost, rough and forgotten. Mendelssohn sniffs it. Smells like gone, he says, just as I thought. Mendelssohn cups his ear, listens to its center, and jots down a slight trace of harp, the bare cry of a faraway boy. With what shall we, asks dear Henry, fix it? The flower in dear Henry's breast pocket is a pink I've never seen before. Lean close, says Mendelssohn. We lean close. This is going to be a nightmare. Dear Henry and I nod our heads. We know already we will need to fetch the water with a bucket to fix the hole, but we will have no bucket to fetch the water to fix the hole because the bucket with which we would fetch the water has a hole. A white balloon wafts over dear Henry's head. We are failing miserably. With what, asks dear Henry, shall we fix it? He asks again because even though we know how everything ends, the ending remains unimaginable. With straw, says Mendelssohn hopelessly. With straw, I guess says Mendelssohn again. I look around for straw. Dear Henry opens a can of sardines. He pulls back the tin lid and offers me one. No thanks, I say. Looking for straw, I say. He offers a sardine to Mendelssohn. Why not, shrugs Mendelssohn. Sardines are caught mainly at night, says dear Henry. I know, says Mendelssohn, chewing slowly on the fish. They are caught when they rise to the surface to feed on plankton, says dear Henry. This is when they're caught, says dear Henry. They're caught at night when they're the hungriest. I know, says Mendelssohn. Everybody knows. Except, I guess, for the sardines, says dear Henry. Mendelssohn laughs. It's not a joke, says dear Henry. Sorry, says Mendelssohn. I'm sorry too, says dear Henry. For what, asks Mendelssohn. Just for everything, says dear Henry. The bucket and the hole and just everything. Even though I am certain when I find the straw, the straw will be too long, and I will need to cut the straw with an ax, but the ax will be too dull, and I will need to sharpen the ax with a stone, but the stone will be too dry, and with a hole in the bucket, there is no hope for ever fetching water to wet the stone. I am nevertheless still looking around for straw. This is the song we're in. I hate this bucket. I hate this bucket, I yell. More than the hole, asks dear Henry. He looks so sad. The hole is the hole that the hole should be. It's the bucket that's destroying us, dear Henry. It's the bucket. I look at Mendelssohn. I mean, I really look at him. Every day, he looks more and more like my mother. With what? Shall we fix it, Mendelssohn? I am exhausted. How many times can a person ask the same question? Mendelssohn kneels gently beside the bucket and reaches all the way in. His dark 
Soft curls cover his eyes. Liza, says dear Henry, grabbing my arm, I think we're dying. With a stone in his hand, Mendelssohn reaches all the way into the bucket, past the hole, past God and summer and almonds and shame and the ocean and mice and love and fevers and worship and snails and teeth and lilac and forgiveness and a song about a bucket with a hole in it and past all the children singing the song and past their children singing it and their children's children and past my broken heart until he reaches the oldest water and wets the stone. He pulls the stone out and sets it right on top of dear Henry's head as if dear Henry were a tombstone and I've come to his grave to mourn him. The wet stone glistens so brightly I need to cover my eyes. With what, asks dear Henry, shall we? I can barely hear him. The song is fading like a song. It is what it is. I remove the wet stone from the top of dear Henry's head and bury it in my pocket. I notice the crack on dear Henry's cheek, cheek shaped like a bucket is spreading. There's a hole in that bucket, too. I look over at Mendelssohn. He is building a whole entire city out of buckets. There are holes in all of these, says Mendelssohn, who is now covered in holes, under a sky covered in holes, lit by a moon covered in holes, kept by prayers covered in holes. Off in the distance, I can already see the people coming to live in Mendelssohn's city of holes. There are so many people, and they are so beautiful and hopeful, and they too are covered in holes. They each carry a bucket, and in each bucket is a hole. This is the song we're in.
the Winter Swimming Club. The air pulses blue outside Kafka's window, and across the Winter Swimming Club's windows are across the river, the Winter Swimming Club's windows are dark. He opens his window and breathes the night air, humming the first verse of his favorite song, its melancholy tune like a call to battle. Now farewell, you little alley. Now adieu, you quiet eaves. Father, mother watched me sadly, and my dearest watched me leave. He thinks of Felice, whom he met only five weeks earlier, but this song is hers. This beginning of a story that, that now twinkles in his imagination like a solitary light in the swimming club. How when they first met at Max's apartment, he alienated himself from her by observing her too closely. The casually thrown on blouse, the coarse blonde hair, the almost broken nose, the bony empty face, the strong chin. But then he'd walked her to her hotel and they chatted and something changed on that walk. Something in her was not easily forgotten and he second guessed his first impression so constantly after that unremarkable walk until he could barely think of anyone else. He had thought of sending flowers to her in Berlin, but had written her instead and she had written back. Two men crossed the bridge over the Vlatava, one gesticulating in silence to the other under the evenly spaced lamps towards the Belvedere Heights and its sprinkled churches, stone walls, wooded hills, with trees losing their leaves. That's the last he notices, until 2 a.m., a wagon passing somewhere nearby, and the sounds of his typewriter, the keys of his olive five like the wings of some great bird perched on top of the mountain, the keys slapping the paper in their predatory way. Only the maid's rambling in the antechambers alerts him to the new day, which he enters the way a mountain climber returns down a rock face, clutching the rope of his creation as he descends. When the maid comes into his room, she stops at the unmade bed as though she's never seen it before, and he, at his cluttered writing desk, simply observes her in his shaving mirror beside the typewriter, like some apparition. She gasps when he stretches and reveals himself as though he too is a ghost, as though they both have manifest themselves to the other from some other plane of existence. I stayed up writing all night, he tells her, and she seems uncertain how to greet such news, whether it's evidence of insomnia or a greater illness self-inflicted. You must be exhausted, she says. I'll prepare some tea for you and she dashes out of the room. While she makes tea, he slips away to his sister's room. Entering without knocking, he sits on Atla's bed, the new pages trembling in his hand. So attuned to her older brother's comings and goings, she has already begun to stir before he even touches her shoulder. She sits up but doesn't smile. It's an old brass bed she sleeps on with a mattress that only Atla could love. So saggy you'd have to send a search party after him if he dared lie down, even skinny as he is. He's too jittery to lie down anyway. His sister Vali, recently engaged, is also stirring, but only to pull her pillow over her head. His other sister, Ellie, sleeps undisturbed. He has that feeling of being emptied, his head buzzing as though he's no longer himself as though he's crossed some great threshold, as though he's either committed some great crime or been released after many years for a crime he didn't commit. In his hands, he holds a story, and he's not sure if it's terrible or great, and so he must read it to Atla, his great ally in these stifling rooms. What have you written, she asks. Can you read it to me? She tilts her chin to the sheaf of papers, this literal, little ritual of theirs, as though she has any choice. Of course he will read it to her, 
But she never treats these morning intrusions as intrusions, as though she's invited him in. He begins to read. It was a Sunday morning at the most beautiful time in spring. George Bendeman, a young merchant, was sitting in his private room on the first floor of one of the low, poorly constructed houses extending in a long row along the river, almost indistinguishable from one another except for their height and color. He had just finished a letter to a friend from his youth, who was now abroad, had sealed it in a playful and desultory manner, and then was looking, elbows propped on the writing table, out of the window at the river, the bridge, and the hills on the other shore with their delicate greenery. It all starts out so innocently, but then the father enters the story, and George begins to understand that the world he thought he knew is different from the world as it is. The world he thought he knew contained a frail father, a friend in Moscow down on his luck, an engagement. In the world as it truly is, the frail father isn't so frail, and he condemns George Bendeman for his lies and manipulations of his relations to other people. As though Bendeman and his father have long been spies for opposing sides, and now Bendeman has at last been unmasked. The story ends with the father's judgment, sentencing his son to death by drowning. By the end of his reading, his hand is moving uncontrollably about his face, and there are tears in his eyes. When he finishes, Atla doesn't speak, as though out of respect for someone with a deep grief. And all she can say finally is, the house in the story is very much like ours which doesn't insult him in the least because she's his sister and he knows how she expresses things, that she's still trying to comprehend him, though there is nothing but a tender admiration in her eyes. If that were so, he tells her, then father would be living in the toilet. She smiles but doesn't laugh. Her head bent to the comforter on her bed. She seems to be looking inward. Otherwise, she says, it's true. Is it, he asks. She nods and he feels a strange joy and conviction that everything can be said, that for everything, even the strangest fancies, there waits a great fire in which they perish and rise up again. That day, he stays back from work and lies on the couch, humming his favorite song, thinking of Felice, of his other sister Valley's recent engagement. He writes for Felice Bauer under the title, and then he puts down his pen and dozes, dreaming that he's just set a world record in swimming at the Winter Swimming Club. All of them, his mother, his father, his sisters, and Felice on the banks of the river, urging him to step out of the water to accept his medals and accolades, though he prefers to stay in the water a little longer it's more comfortable, he assures them, though really he's just worried that if he steps on dry land, he might drown.
I do not wish to go into the volcano. New York, 1978. 
The night Paul and I had agreed to have sex, he arrived with a branch of yellow freesia that smelled like juicy fruit, a package of tipperillos, and a Charleston chew. I come in peace, he said, and smiled. I plucked the Charleston chew from his hand. I looked into the hallway, to the right, to the left, and made sure he wasn't spotted, and I nodded him silently into the apartment as if it were a speakeasy. I bolted the door behind him, then chained it. I appraised the Charleston chew in my two palms. Who knew you could find them here? Who knew where to look, even? I closed my eyes and turned it around in my fingers, and when the paper wrapper crackled and exhaled its fumes, I thought I might actually faint. I wanted badly to bury my face in it. You said you liked those back when you ate candy, like a regular person. I love them, I said. Super, Paul said. When was that exactly? How old were you then when you ate the candies? I abandoned Paul to the foyer. I guessed he supposed he should ask all these personal questions now that we were going to have sex. It was a courtesy, this line of inquiry, that I knew straight fellows affected, but I wondered where Paul had heard of it. The movies, I guessed, or maybe Canada. I retired to my fainting couch with my tipperillos and my Charleston chew, and I tried not to weep with the joy of it. Can I come in? Paul said, still standing in the foyer, holding the branch of freesia. Mornings on the Upper West Side, the ballerinas, pared down like eels, stretch and bend into the long light. At the bar, they reach past themselves for themselves with exquisite indifference. A ballet mistress floats in on tiptoe, a little skirt just concealing her ass. She claps her tiny hands, which flutter around her like a fan, and sings, people, people, and they all glide to attention. On the east side, at the Martha Graham School of Modern Dance, we throw a virgin into a volcano to start the day. I am an affront to Armgard von Bardelleben, who leads our class at Martha Graham. Armgard is a towering Aryan monster woman whose name has limbs in it. It is impossible for me to disguise how frightened I am of her. It is there in the mirror for the entire room to see and from every angle. She gives us the combination and the pianist begins to play. He is a furious Jamaican with long dreadlocks and he shakes his head no, 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 when he plays and when he doesn't. He resides in a state of refusal. <laughs> from across the room, Armgard eyes me suspiciously. I am already off tempo. I am, as a rule, too much in my own head, in my own world. I'm too dependent on the mirror. I don't listen to the music. I am an adolescent girl given to abstraction, and no matter how hard I try to hold fast to my body, it escapes me. It's quicker and nimbler than I am. Years from now, when I am in college, I'll learn to blame the Gnostics for starting this argument. <laughs> I'll shake my fist to high heaven and call them fuckers. Why did you do it, you fuckers? But today, I am a head chasing after a body on 63rd Street and 2nd Avenue, and this spectacle infuriates Armgard von Bardelleben. Ach, du lieber Gott! She screams. The Jamaican accompanist rears up like a horse and lands back on the keys. You, you, Armgard starts. And in the mirror, I watch her pull off her ballet slipper to fight me. <laughs> Paul
Paul's body is so attenuated and refined, I might pulverize him. I am such a galoot, such an irredeemable oaf. Outside the studio, I am a sprawling mess of errant parts, only here they haven't pushed aside all the furniture. I walk two fingers up the rungs of Paul's sternum and balance on his clavicle. I'm going to jump, I say, with quavering finger knees, and in a second distant voice call back, do it, do it. I enact the small suicide one time after another. We're not getting anywhere with this, Paul says. Paul has come here to do me this favor. There is nothing for him in it except the opportunity for convention, which is a novelty. Paul is a faggot. Say it, darling, he tells me, with gusto. I cannot say it, nor can I say what I am, a virgin, but I don't have to because it's there for all the world to see like a giant pineapple growing out of my head. <laughs> Every week my virginity sprouts a new garish fruit and soon I will labor under the weight of a headdress as high as Carmen Miranda's. <laughs> I want it off me. The night we made our date with convention, Paul said, say I'm a faggot or I won't sleep with you. Between the bed and the wall where I have wedged myself, it's soft and warm on one side, cool and pristine on the other. I am perfectly balanced on the equator. My darling, Paul says, this can't work. Not with you over there and me over here. What's happening? I love it here, I say. <laughs> you love it. How fabulous for you. <laughs> but you're hiding from me, and that makes me feel lonely. That makes me feel like a crumb. Why, I ask, you're not supposed to care. The point was that you don't care. Paul stands and pulls the bed from the wall. I drop from the equator straight to the floor. OK, he says, that was mean, and lies down. That was a mean thing to say, and you said it. This is why I must never speak, I tell myself. I lie under the bed, my palms on the box springs where I imagine Paul's body should be. Paul, I say, in a voice so small it's nearly a whisper, Paul, I love you. You don't have to say that, he says. It's true, I say. You don't have to mean it either. Armgard von Bardelleben has stopped class to make me turn across the floor until I am able to locate the music in my body. We have all the day, yes? She asks the class. The class agrees we do. I begin on a clean diagonal, but after several passes, I pick up speed and start to veer. Don't you stop, you, she shouts. Don't you dream to stop. The Jamaican accompanist sees I'm headed for him and stretches both arms across his keyboard. As I reach him, he bolts off the bench and takes hold of me by the bun. He walks me backwards into the waist of the grand piano like a tango. He brings his face to my ear. Girl, he says, his breath hot on my neck, this is my home. You've come into my house now. Better, Armgard says, and waves the class back to the center. Alone in my bed at night, the furious Jamaican pianist and I dance. In our dance, we run circles around each other. I circle once, twice. 
The third time I run and throw myself into his arms. He winds up like a hammer thrower, the sweat flying from his dreads. He turns and turns and hurls me across the music, and somehow he's catching me on the other side. Thank you. 
our shared relevant irrelevance, or a brief history of love. One, at 35, the cat brings us a mouse. At the threshold of our bedroom door, she sits between the legs of a modern wooden chair, pushing her gift toward you and your flashlight like a recently bar mitzvahed teenager paying for deodorant. It is late or early, and the house is baked in its own congestion as I sweep the stiff rodent into a dustpan and bury it in the air of our recently mortgaged first front porch. Re-entering the entryway, I look at the cat, at the space between the chair and the threshold of our bedroom door and announce what I understand to be a sudden reverent truth. There is no blood, I say, no evident defense of how we live in part together. I stand in the darkness. The night hangs around the clouded light like cheap, aggressive bunting. In the morning, we will go to work. Two, at 30, I collapse a building, take the whole built thing straight down on a Tuesday and leave a small series of post-dated checks to help those in the wreckage come out on their feet. In the parking lot of a national tax adjusting agency, I call my mother to tell her what I've rationally done. If it's true, she says, what will we do with the earrings we bought her for Hanukkah? A bearded man dressed as the Statue of Liberty stands slouched on the corner behind me, holding a spinning sign and the keys to a wood paneled minivan. I want to know what love is, I say. Stop singing, my mother says. This is serious. Three, at 31, I'm told to grab the crowbar. We are on a ranch, a Wyoming summer, big bursts of burnt earth stretched long along the skyline a casserole suited too big for its oven. His ribs are broken, thrown from a horse, five lines in his torso struck rivered and split. In the rafters of a barn, we were brought here to clear a thin mother pack rat makes herself an awareness. Six babies attached to her belly for feed Drunk bags of live organs hung almost at play. When instructed again, we grab the metal letter and stand on a tool bench epoxied in feces. Hit it in the face, he says, and nobody moves. The night before, in a bar outside of Denver, I lifted a moped to the back of a trailer and got a free drink and a married woman's phone number. You pulled me away, drove me to a mattress store, an airport, back to a cabin to wake by this barn, the throb in my temples unfit for our job. Hit it in the face, he says again, and we engage in several minutes of action and rest. When it's over, I take the six curled babies to an unopened gate and remove their sprung heads with the face of a shovel. This is ranch life, we are told, and the two of us nod. True. In the next year, one of us will marry, another will divorce, another will be back at a bar, drowned ice in warm amber, swimming his body towards something we lost. Four, at 32, I awake in a hotel room with your bridesmaid late for brunch. We are roped in California, a severed melon on the floor, the day branched and never leafing while I root for missing keys. 
Suffered in the light of your interfaithless union, you call my telephone to tell me what it's like to be on time. Later that afternoon, sick in the back of an over-odored minivan, I listen as my father sells my failures to the crowd. You danced alone for hours, he said. Your jacket's still your only date. I know, I say, and ask to stop the car. You need a partner, my sister says, and I open wide the door. Outside, white hills still birth around us like a flagrant laundered line. It's true. I respond, all of it. My mother looks at her watch. We never talk about the ways in which I trailer wrecked your wedding or how I never bought a gift. Instead, I eat Thai food on a field of paper napkins for my dinner, go to sleep with my wallet on my chest like a hand. Five. At 33, I collapse another building. Don't bring the whole thing down with any calculated purpose, but hold the wide foundation thin and flood it till it drops. From my chair outside the graveyard, I hear the acts of your lame structure stomach nothing and react, then write to you a letter saying, ship the body home. Later, in a scrimmage of bone and whistle, you find yourself sick in my laminated bathroom. Eleven blocks from where we first began to misremember, I tell you what I cannot do, then do it till it's done. By summer, my therapist asks why everything around me is always on fire. If I told you the truth, I say, you'd put away the water. Six. At 34, the apartment is locked and I watch the clock inside it. I am not drinking. I am recovered in medication. I am a long boat of arraignments, no water to waddle, no crew on the deck save me and my dock shoes. The doctor is calling and I answer by pharmaceutically responding to the questions she told me last session would be asked. There is always a boyfriend, I say. There are jobs in the East. They leave me for leaving them low in a factory, an elevator we have been riding in heat. This will never change, I say. And there is some truth in the trust of my thrushing bald faith. The neighbor boy cries because his mother is shaving. The doctor says, now I need another doctor. I open my eyes to the staples I use to keep what I keep kept from coming, kept out, and when I can finally focus, it's you. Seven. At 35, the cat brings us a mouse in the house we bought to settle my tremors. Here, we make together a garden, make color on walls, make grow the refrigerator, ripe shadows of payment. Here, it is you I find hot fleshed in our sheets, hair wrapped in a package of coarse evaluated metrics, my drumming alarm singing me your emergency. What ways I can't stomach you leaving are plenty. What electric discrediting I will not survive. In the kitchen, I watch the cat bathe herself long in production. Her foot in her mouth, her mouth feet from your foot. Always I've waited for such relevant proximity. For what we brought down to build up here together. For you and your ambulant heart to appear.
You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community.